Um, hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. People are just being admitted uh, from the waiting room. So I propose to just wait for a little while for, for people to join, if that's OK. I caught you just at the right time, uh, but don't worry. I mean, we'll we'll, we'll speak uh, we'll speak soon. Uh, I just want. Okay, we've reached, um, let me see, we have reached 72 participants, so, which is great. Uh, so I'm proposing to, to start the meeting now. So, ladies and gentlemen and friends, good evening. Thank you very much for attending this special SACU meeting on China and the Ukraine crisis. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Keith Bennett, and I'm a long-standing member of SACU. In fact, my first full-time job after I graduated from SOAS in 1979 was with SACU for two years up to 1981. Since February, the conflict in Ukraine, as well as the real danger of a wider conflict, even a nuclear one, has gripped the attention of the world. The terrible destruction and the suffering inflicted on the Ukrainian people has drawn the compassion and the solidarity of people throughout the world, not least in Britain. With the unprecedented response to Russia's military intervention in Ukraine on the part of the United States, NATO, the EU, and a handful of others, we also appear to be faced with a turning point in world politics. One fraught with dangers of cataclysmic conflict, but also perhaps with just a chance of leading to the creation of a new security architecture aimed at guaranteeing the rights of all. And just as we feel for the Ukrainian people in their present predicament, we need to keep in mind that for much of the world, their plight has been the rule rather than the exception, particularly in the post-Soviet era. This has been a period of history which has seen leading Western powers visit far worse destruction on Iraq, Afghanistan, and Libya, among other countries. This in large part explains the somewhat different response to the present crisis from much of the global South, as compared to the leading Western powers. For them, bombardment, destruction, displacement, and refugee flows are sadly all too familiar. Inevitably, much attention has fallen on the response and attitude real and imagined of China to the crisis. In part, this reflects the fact that China is now the world's second largest economy, has for, has for some time been the main engine of global growth and is one of the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. Therefore, it's clear that no major global problem today can be solved without the constructive engagement and involvement of China. But more especially, it's a widely held perception that over recent years, the ties between Moscow and Beijing have grown closer and closer. And alongside this, we've seen the marked deterioration of China's relations with the United States and the United Kingdom in particular. The state visit of President Xi Jinping and the golden era in our bilateral relations proclaimed by David Cameron and George Osborne feels like a pretty distant memory now. SACU, of course, is not a political organization, and our members have all sorts of views on all sorts of issues, but we have understanding in our name for a reason, and that is our purpose this evening. To facilitate that understanding, we've assembled what I consider a veritable galaxy of outstanding speakers, each a distinguished expert in their own fields, I'm sure that their varied perspectives will enlighten us all. I will introduce them more properly when it is their turn to speak, 
but briefly, they are Jenny Clegg, Vice President of SACU and China Specialist, Wang Qi, Minister Councillor of the Chinese Embassy in London, Konstantinos Simonis, Lecturer in Chinese Society at the Lao China Institute of King's College London, Martin Jakes, Edit, author of the global bestseller, When China Rules the World. John Gittings, former foreign leader writer and East Asia editor for The Guardian, currently a research associate at the China Institute at SOAS. And hopefully we will also be joined by Victor Gao, the vice president of the Center for China and Globalization, who is also a former English language interpreter for Deng Xiaoping. I should add, that we will have a chance to debate their views and the overall topic of China and the Ukraine crisis more fully and offer our own thoughts with an open mic in a special China chat on June the 9th at 5 p.m. This is for SACU members only, so if you want to continue the discussion and you're not already a SACU member, now is the perfect time to join. I should also add for your information that this event is being recorded. And so to our first speaker, Dr. Jenny Clegg is an old friend of mine and she's been a SACU member for even longer than I have. She is an independent writer and researcher, a longtime China specialist and a lifelong member and now a vice president of SACU. A former senior lecturer in international and Asia Pacific studies, her published work includes China's global strategy towards a multipolar world, published by Pluto Press in 2009. And before that, Fu Manchu and the Yellow Peril, The Making of a Racist Myth, which was published by Trentham Books. She has published articles in various journals, both academic and non-academic, and has taken part in numerous public events and webinars. Jenny is also active in the peace and anti-war movement in Britain. So thank you, over to you, Jenny. Oh, thanks Keith for that introduction. I feel very privileged to be part of such a distinguished panel. Um, I'd like to say, uh, first of all, that um, unlike China, I personally would deplore Russia's action, but our job in SACU is to understand China. And I think the ideas that China is failing to act responsibly to uphold the UN Charter, looking only to its own selfish interests or building a new Russia-China anti-Western bloc are based on misunderstandings. China has said that the situation in the Ukraine is not something it wishes to see. From the beginning, it has called for restraint, saying sovereign rights should be safeguarded. And China, we should note, uh, did not endorse uh, Russia's takeover of Crimea in 2014. At the same time, China has also called for Russia's legitimate security appeals to be taken seriously. In the joint Russia-China statement, China expressed its own concerns over NATO's expansion for the first time. After all, as Keith said, China itself is now um, seen by the US as its main security challenger, and NATO has now identified China as a systemic competitor. Now, in fact, very few countries in the global south have joined the West, uh, first of all, in sanctioning China and uh, UN motions deploring Russia's action have seen considerable abstentions in a world littered with the West's own unaccounted for war crimes. Many around the world are unimpressed by the double standards being displayed. However, at the UN General Assembly vote to expel Russia from the Human Rights Council at the end of March, China, along with others, switched to vote against this. So was this not condoning Russia's action? We need to understand China's practice in international affairs, um, which starts from a long-term view, taking a cautious and pragmatic approach, avoiding risks, promoting stability. And over the longer term, the West, after all, is losing its dominant position. And across Eurasia, power is shifting to the East. The landmass has long been viewed as a key area of potential conflict with US foreign policy analyst uh, Brzezinski predicting back in 1997 that Ukraine would serve as a key geopolitical pivot. So to avoid the earthquakes, volcanoes, nuclear war even, that such tectonic shifts can cause, 
China chose the win-win path of the Belt and Road Initiative, which saw it in fact develop close links with Ukraine to become its major trading partner. So with the bigger picture in mind, let's move on. As the war advanced, we saw China facing its own security issues increasingly, tackling COVID and seeking to stabilize the situation in and around Afghanistan. Um, nevertheless, it has given several charges of humanitarian aid to the Ukrainian people. With good relations on both sides, it seemed China would make an ideal mediator, but then came the false claim from US intelligence that China was secretly supplying Russia with arms, quite possibly undermining trust on the Ukrainian side. So China's experiences of conflict uh, resolution have not been that good. Uh, the six party talks on Korean denuclearization come to mind. And China was also chair in 2003, when the UN Security Council together failed to, uh, sorry, failed to hold together on the question of Iraq. Mediators can't work miracles. It takes commitment from all sides. Um, and I want to draw attention to the fact uh, that later in 2003, China actually supported the UN in legitimizing the occupation of Iraq. Not that it thought that the occupation was a good thing, but for the UN to work effectively, it needed the US to be brought back in. Perhaps then voting to keep Russia in the Human Rights Council was not so much out of loyalty as a pragmatic collectivism. As they said, if you throw someone overboard, there will be less people to paddle the boat. And we should never underestimate China's deep rooted commitment to the UN, whose formation marked the end of the century of humiliation as China became one of the five permanent members of the Security Council for its part in the defeat of worldwide fascism at a cost, it should be said, of some 15 to 20 million lives. Now, the UN uh, not only commits to uh, the principle of sovereignty, but also to the peaceful resolution of conflict or situations that might lead to conflict and as well to fostering friendly relations among nations. And it's in line with this that China defends Russia's security interests, calling on NATO and the US to reflect on how they've contributed to the tensions. So to avoid the further race to arms, China in fact advances the notion of the indivisibility of security or common security, that a country should not pursue their own security at the cost of others. The idea of common security was advanced by Olaf Palm in the 1980s against the nuclear arms race and today by the renowned Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, which maintains that any country's security depends also on the actions and reactions of potential adversaries. As Palm said, security can be obtained only through cooperative under undertakings. So now in the West, there are some people who warn what is happening in Europe today could happen in the Indo-Pacific tomorrow, claiming China is planning the exact same action against Taiwan, ignoring the fact, of course, that Taiwan is actually a part of China whilst Ukraine is a sovereign state. But at the recent, recent Bo Ao Forum, Xi Jinping made common security the key theme of his speech, launching a global security initiative he made a strong appeal to other Asian nations not to allow instability to spread into their own region and to respect each other's security concerns. The, UK, the Ukraine war has been cast as a moral crusade with democracies in an epic struggle against the advance of autocracy. China says it doesn't have to be this way. Yes, there are political differences, but these should not be used to marginalize other issues and divide us at a time when global cooperation is so desperately needed to tackle pandemics and climate catastrophe. Common security is surely an idea whose time has come. For the West, security is a matter of, for sovereign nations to decide on their own. China's appeal is to consider the bigger picture Pragmatism is not about putting self-interest first, but seeking to reduce friction and conflict and help restore stability. It is not that China lacks a moral compass, 
Rather, it has its own perspective on improving the human condition through good relationships based on respect, responsibility, reciprocity, as well as rights. China and Russia share a view of a multipolar world, but differ in their approach. Far from pursuing an anti-Western bloc, China is working behind the scenes to build trust, keep the UN intact, and minimize the impact of the Ukraine war on Asia and on EU-China relations. In this way, China seeks to create the conditions for common security to meet the world's shared challenges. In this way, it shows its commitment to avoid schism so as to hold the world collective, the big family, together. Thank you. Thank you very much um, indeed, Jenny. That was, if I may say so, admirably comprehensive and, and I found it uh, uh, quite profound and, and really interesting to listen to. So thank you very much. And we're up to 107 participants at the moment, which I think is great. Um, so I'm going to um, move on to our next um, uh, speaker. Um, our next speaker, who I'm very pleased to, to welcome, is Dr. Wang Chi. He is the Minister Councillor of the Chinese Embassy in the UK, and we're very grateful to him for speaking, and we're very grateful to the Chinese Embassy uh, for uh, cooperating with us in, in organising this meeting. Dr. Wang joined China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1995, where he worked in the Department of North American and Oceanian Affairs. And over the next 18 years, he served alternately on two occasions at the department and at the Chinese Embassy in the United States. From 2013 to 2019, he worked at the Office of the Foreign Affairs Leading Group of the Communist Party of China's Central Committee. And in 2019, he was assigned to London to take up his current position, which is his first posting in Europe. Uh, so Dr. Wang, I'm sure everybody is really interested uh, to hear what you have to uh, tell us. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Zoe Reid, Mr. Keith Burnett, <clears throat> distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, Good afternoon. It is a real delight to join you at the soccer panel discussion. On behalf of Chinese Embassy in the UK, I would like to pay tribute and express our thanks to all the guests present today for your care and support for China-UK friendship and cooperation. In today's world, the profound changes on seen in a hundred years are precipitated by the worst pandemic of century. And the world has to deal with riding instabilities, uncertainties, and insecurities, as well as sluggish economic recovery and a widening development gap. Against this background, President Xi Jinping, with the future and destiny of humanity in mind, and in search of solutions to the root cause for security predicament, proposed the Global Security Initiative at the opening ceremony of the Boa Forum for Asia Annual Conference 2022. This initiative offers a clear answer to the question of our times. That is, what kind of security vision the world needs and how to achieve common security. It represents China's wisdom and solution for the world in meeting security challenges. The Global Security Initiative is built on six points. First, we must stay committed to the vision of common, comprehensive, cooperative, and sustainable security, and work together to maintain world peace and security. Second, we must stay committed to respecting the sovereignty and territorial integrity 
of all countries, uphold non-interference in internal affairs, and respect the independent choices of developed parts and social systems made by people of different countries. Third, we must stay committed to abiding by the purpose and principles of UN Charter, reject the Cold War mentality, oppose unilateralism, and say no to group politics and block confrontation. Fourth, we must stay committed to taking the legitimate security concerns of all countries seriously, uphold the principle of invisible security, build a balanced, effective, and sustainable security architecture, and oppose the pursuit of one's own security at the cost of others' security. Fifth, we must stay committed to peacefully resolving differences and disputes between countries through dialogue and consultation, support all efforts conducive to the peaceful settlement of crisis, reject the double standards and oppose the wanton use of unilateral sections and long arm jurisdiction. Sixth, we must stay committed to maintaining security in both traditional and non-traditional domains and work together on regional disputes and global challenges such as terrorism, climate change, cybersecurity, and biosecurity. These six points meet the urgent need of the national community to safeguard world peace and prevent conflicts and wars. They reflect the common pursuit of all countries to uphold multilateralism and international solidarity. And they echo the extensive aspiration of the peoples of all countries to overcome the current difficulties and create a better world post-pandemic hand in hand. China did not stop at just proposing the initiative. China has taken concrete steps to implement this important initiative. China firmly upholds the authority and central role of United Nations. We stand ready to work with other countries to practice true multilateralism and oppose any move that undermines international order in the name of so-called rules and drags the world into a new Cold War. China remains committed to the May major direction of promoting peace talks. We stand ready to work with other countries to explore the critical settlement of hotspot issues, uphold justice, and encourage dialogue. We call on all parties to be stabilizers for peace rather than agitators for conflicts. China supports coordinated efforts in addressing security threats, both traditional and non-traditional. We stand ready to work with other countries to improve the global security governance system and practice the vision of extensive consultation, joint contribution, and shared benefit in order to prevent and solve security predicament. China puts equal emphasis on development and security. We stand ready to work with other countries to promote the robust recovery of the world economy, actively implement the Global Development Initiative proposed by China, accelerate the realization of the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and achieve sustainable security through sustainable development. China supports the building of a new framework for regional security. We stand ready to work with relevant countries to safeguard peace and stability in Asia. Firmly reject the vision of the region, region under the pretext of the Indo-Pacific strategy. 
and we and oppose the move to peace together and Asian, Asia Pacific NATO based on military alliance. China looks forward to having in-depth exchange of views with other countries on the Global Security Initiative, pulling global efforts and promoting the implementation of the initiative. Working together, the countries of the world can contribute to their respective wisdom and strengthen and the strength to the political settlement of international and regional hotspot issues and to world peace and tranquility. Together, we can build a global community of security for all. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, China's position on the Ukraine issue has been open, transparent, objective, fair, and consistent. China finds it deeply regrettable that the situation in Ukraine has come to where it is today. China always stands on the right on the side of peace and draws its conclusion independently based on the merits of the issue. China's position has always been that the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of all countries should be respected. The principles and the purpose of UN Charter should be observed. The legitimate security concerns of all countries should be taken into serious consideration. China has following thoughts on settling the Ukraine issue under the current situation. First, promote peace talks. Peace talks are the only viable way to prevent escalation of tensions. China has been promoting peace talks in its own way. President Xi Jinping has had telephone conversations with the leaders of Russia, France, Germany, and the European Union, respectively. And State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi has also talked over the phone with foreign ministers from a dozen countries. All these talks are aimed at alleviating the crisis in Korea and encouraging the relevant parties to settle the issue through negotiation. The international community should continue to create favorable conditions and environment for the negotiations between Russia and Ukraine and make room for political settlement rather than add fuel to the fire, heighten the tensions, or shift the blame onto others. Second, prevent a humanitarian crisis on a bigger scale. China has put forward a six-point initiative on the humanitarian situation in, U in Ukraine. China has also provided multiple batches of emergency humanitarian assistance to Ukraine and send supplies to some European countries that are receiving large numbers of refugees. We would like to maintain communication with all countries and work together to prevent a humanitarian crisis on a bigger scale. Third, fostering, foster lasting peace in Europe and the Euro Eurasian continent. The root cause of the Ukrainian crisis is the tensions around the issue of regional security that have slowly built up, built up in Europe over the years. To address the root cause, the legitimate security concerns of the real parties should be accommodated. In building global and regional security framework in today's world, no one should go back and resort to the Cold War mentality. China supports Europe, Russia, the US, and the NATO in engaging dialogue, tackling the tensions that have built up over the years head on, finding a solution, and building a balanced, effective, and sustainable security framework in Europe. Fourth, prevent regional conflict from magnifying in a desperate situation, one tends to catch any storm 
or focus on a single issue, expense of the big picture. Such impulse must be avoided if the Ukraine crisis is to be handled properly. The entire world should not be held hostage. The only people around the world should not be made to pay. The global economy must not be criticized and used as a tool or even a weapon in this crisis, as this would trigger more serious crisis in global finance, trade, energy, science, technology, food security, and industrial and supply chains. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, history proves time and again that without peace, development is like water without source. Without security, prosperity is like a tree without roots. China would like to join hands with all countries and peoples who love peace and pursue development to implement the global security initiative so as to provide more driving forces for building a community with a shared future for mankind. Together, we can make the world a more peaceful, secure, and prosperous place. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wang Chi, thank you so much for that very comprehensive and, and thorough exposition of China's position on, on the Ukraine issue and all the, the many issues that, that surround it. We're really grateful to you for taking the time and trouble uh, to, to prepare and, and present that. And thank, thank you very much indeed. Um, we've been fluctuating between 114 to 117 people on, on, this, uh, on this webinar in, in the, over the last period. And I think that's a reflection of how, um, how much um, interest there is in, in this very important topic. So it now gives me a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who is Konstantinos uh, Simonis. And he is a lecturer in Chinese society at the Lao China Institute, King's College London. He is also a member of the editorial board of the People's Map of Global China and of the advisory editorial board of the Journal of the European Association for Chinese Studies. He is also a senior research fellow at the Institute of International Relations in Athens and a fellow of the Mediterranean Program for International Environmental Law and Negotiation in Athens. His books include a monograph entitled The Chinese Communist Youth League, Juniority and Responsiveness in a Party Youth Organization, which was published by the Amsterdam University Press, and Belt and Road, The First Decade, issued by Agenda Publishing House in Newcastle this year and co-authored with Dr. Igor Rogelja of University College London. He is currently working with Dr. Fernanda Odilla of Bologna and King's College London on an edited volume entitled Corruption and Anti-Corruption Upside Down, New Perspectives from the Global South for the Political Corruption and Governance series of Palgrave Macmillan. His articles have appeared in Modern China, Europe Asia Studies, the Chinese Journal of International Politics, the Chinese Journal of Political Science, and the Journal of Youth Studies, among others. His research has been funded by various organizations, including the British Academy and the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. Many of us have enjoyed uh, events before at, um, many of us in, have enjoyed events before at um, King's, at the Lao Institute, and we really congratulate the Lao Institute both for their willingness to work with others and for becoming a premier center for Chinese studies in the UK. So. Costas, if I may, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Keith. Uh, Saku is one of, uh, of our favorite partners at, at the Lao, so I'm really happy to be with you uh, today. So, um, so February 2022, um, as China scholars and researchers, uh, we started to disentangle the, the implications of the pandemic for the future uh, of the Belt and Road Initiative and for the future of, of, of China's uh, economic development, Russia uh, invaded Ukraine. 
Now, the humanitarian disaster and atrocities of the Russian army have a devastating effect, of course, on the Ukrainian population, but the impact of the, of the invasion is global, um, as war has a, a debilitating effect on production, trade, and financial flows, and of course, infrastructure. We see that in all those uh, pictures of, of destruction every day. Now, it is well known, of course, that Russia um, and Ukraine are major agricultural producers, while Moscow is a key exporter of natural gas and oil, uh, which results in many countries experiencing rampant inflation and threats uh, to food and energy security due to the invasion and, of course, due to the international sanctions imposed on Putin's regime. Uh, China has publicly expressed uh, support for Russia, but its actual stance and the reasons behind it have been interpreted differently. Uh, Yan Shui Tong, a leading Chinese academic, in a recent Foreign Affairs uh, article, argued that China has been following a middle path that seeks to avoid provoking, uh, provoking either Russia or the US. Um, and despite significant uh, economic losses as a result of the war, uh, as Yan explains, uh, he estimates the losses around 10 billion. Uh, China is continuing uh, its economic engagement uh, with Moscow, uh, but does not provide, provide military aid, a stance that is not that different to that of India, for instance. Now, others, of course, disagree, uh, arguing that China's position is not that of a middle path, given its public statements and emphasizing more the connection uh, with President Xi Jinping's uh, domestic political agenda. Uh, Sam Crane, a US scholar in a foreign policy article recently argued that uh, given the strongly anti-American uh, propaganda of the party under Xi uh, that has blamed the US for uh, domestic problems and global issues alike, uh, you know, from Hong Kong to the pandemic, it would have been impossible for China to follow the US lead on responding to Moscow without raising doubts about Xi's political judgment. Now, also poll by the Carter Center, uh, that's a recent one, uh, recorded 75% support for Russia in China, um, uh, which, which of course uh, supports the view that at least on the level of public statements, and symbolic led, uh, gestures, uh, there are important domestic reasons for China to support uh, Russia. Now, this is broadly how the debate has evolved so far, uh, focusing on China's international intentions and domestic limitations. Now, in my view, China is really uh, in a difficult position because the invasion has created a lose-lose situation. We need to factor that uh, in our analysis if uh, we are to understand its position. Now, there are uh, significant uh, economic losses, lost investment, uh, trade, uh, financial flows, uh, and, man and even manufacturing. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, there are diplomatic losses. Now, the, the invasion is exactly the opposite of what China stands for. China has a rich diplomatic tradi tradition of promoting non-interference, uh, you know, the Bandung Conference, the non-aligned movement, and so on. Uh, and this contradicts uh, the public support towards Russia, especially the first couple of months of the invasion. Also, in the short to medium run, what we see is that Europe and the US will come out stronger and more united. Uh, we have NATO expansion, okay, two prominent members are, uh, two new prominent members are joining. Uh, the now justified need for more defense spending, uh, which will mean a, a more militarized Europe and a, more, a Europe more closely aligned uh, to the U to US uh, security interests. Now, another problem for China uh, has to do with economic strategy. Now, since uh, it's been a few years now that uh, the party introduced the whole concept of the dual circulation strategy, Xi Jinping's new economic dogma, according to which China will focus on its huge domestic market to increase domestic consumption and become technologically self-reliant by developing its own cutting edge technologies. Uh, but <coughs> also it has, uh, and this is the domestic circulation aspect, 
but there is also the international circulation aspect, which, which means that China will grow its exports and will try to create more demand uh, for Chinese companies, uh, companies and products abroad. Okay. This is what, of course, the, the, the Belt and Road is all about. Now, uh, a recent study identified, I think quite convincingly, two factors that will potentially determine uh, the future of, of the BRI, of the Belt and Road, uh, and by association, the future of China's uh, uh, economic strategy, and that is globalization and multilateralism. Both uh, will be severely impacted by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, and of course, the COVID pandemic, uh, globalization refers, of course, to the continued integration of the global economy. Uh, and multilateralism is the political side of globalization, uh, which refers to trends in global governance and cooperation. Of course, both are deeply hurt uh, by the Russian invasion. Now, uh, the future will depend uh, on the future of globalization in an increasingly polarized world. Um, in that regard, Russia's invasion of Ukraine showcases the limits and fragility uh, of China's economic strategy and the BRI, and its ultimate dependence on global geopolitics. For all these reasons, China want, clearly wanted uh, a quick end. Xi Jinping actually said to Biden in March that China did not want the invasion. Uh, China has called for restraint and for a way to have a ceasefire. Um, after all, there are no clear Chinese gains here. Um, Russia might become more dependent on China, which will give the latter a bargaining power on, on access in energy, in its energy resources, but this is a very marginal benefit if one considers the losses. To make matters worse, a strong democracy versus autocracy Cold War, fra Cold War frame is becoming prevalent. Now, this is not that something that China desires as its economic success depends on connectivity. Now, to conclude, the only way for China out of the present situation is to play a decisive role in the peace process that will follow. I expect that I have to say a more active role, but it seems that Beijing is waiting for Russia to achieve its main strategic ob objectives uh, on the field, on the ground, before intervening. Uh, if that's true, Beijing is losing the only opportunity it will have to cut their diplomatic losses in relation to advanced economies. Now, but in the West, uh, we have to avoid uh, treating China and Russia as one and find ways to use China to bring Russia to the table of negotiations. Now, Kissinger noted recently that it is unwise to go against two adversaries in a way that drives them together. Okay. And this is something that we need in Europe uh, and the West to have in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, Costas, for uh, what I thought was a very um, a balanced uh, and um, a, a very a very balanced and um, a, a and and a fair presentation of, of, of the subject and, and extremely interesting points that that you you put forward. Um, I'd now like to. Um, introduce um, our next speaker is one of the um, one of the most famous names in um, in uh, writing and, and commenting on, on China in the UK. Um, Martin Jakes, a, a good friend to many of us, is the author of the global bestseller When China Rules the World, The End of the Western World and the Birth of a New Global Order, which was first published in 2009. It has since sold over 350,000 copies and been translated into 15 languages. The second edition of the book, greatly expanded, revised and updated, was published in 2012. Martin is a visiting professor at Tsinghua University in Beijing and Fudan University in Shanghai. Until recently, he was a senior fellow at the Department of Politics and International Studies at Cambridge University and was previously a senior visiting research fellow at IDEAS, a center for diplomacy and grand strategy at the London School of Economics. He was also a fellow of the Transatlantic Academy at, in Washington, DC. Martin, I believe, has um, been working for some time on, on his next book, and I'm sure that I'm not alone in eagerly looking forward uh, to that whenever it's published. And 
also been looking forward to hearing what he has to say this evening is always extremely interesting to listen to. So, Martin, please. Martin, you need to unmute. Technical hitch. Um, uh, thank you for those remarks, uh, 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 Keith, and uh, thank you very much uh, to um, to uh, Saku. Uh, it's an honour to be invited to join this panel, and uh, I must say that I, this is the first time I've participated in a discussion in the UK uh, like this. So. Uh, on this subject, so this is really very timely. Uh, I want to make basically three main points. First, concerning the causes of the Ukraine war. I should start by saying that I was opposed to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But as in all such events, the underlying problem was not monocausal, but multi-causal. Russia over a long period expressed concern about the expansion of NATO up to, or at least close to its borders. Ultimately, this problem goes back to the post-Cold War settlement and the attitude adopted by the United States. Russia was treated as a defeated nation and no serious attempt was made to include it in a new European security architecture. Russia remained on the outside and found itself increasingly demonized. The failure of the US to create a robust and inclusive security architecture led to the present war and what is now the collapse of the post-war, the post-Cold War settlement. It is a reminder that Russia is part of Europe and European peace depends on Russia's inclusion. In its hour of triumph, and unipolarity, the US made two huge errors. This was one. The other was the Iraq and Afghan wars. My second point, what is the nature of the relationship between China and Russia? It has been widely argued in the West that it is akin to or a prelude to an alliance. This interpretation seemingly rests on one sentence in the long joint statement agreed between the two countries on the 4th of February this year. Namely, it reads, friendship between the two states has no limits. There are no forbidden areas of cooperation. There is absolutely no further evidence in the document or elsewhere for that matter, for the idea of a budding alliance between the two. I think such an interpretation is quite wrong. It also ignores the fundamental trajectory of Chinese foreign policy during the reform period. Rather than military alliances in the Western mold, China has exclusively chosen the route of strategic partnerships with many, many countries, which are overwhelmingly economic in character and never military. It is true that China and Russia share certain interests and views, notably their negative attitude towards the United States and its role as the global hegemon, and related to this, the present structure of international institutions like the IMF. They also enjoy a significant economic complementarity Russia is rich in natural resources and very weak in its manufacturing capacity. China is poorly endowed with natu natural resources and the most competitive manufacturing country in the world. But that does not make an alliance. It makes a powerful case for close economic cooperation. The Western mantra since around 2018 has been to define the world in terms of democracies and autocracies, with China and Russia lumped together in the latter category. 
Furthermore, the Western turn against China has sought to equate the Chinese Communist Party with the CPSU and China with the former Soviet Union. In fact, they have little in common. The Soviet Union failed. China is a huge success. The CPSU was incapable of renewal. The CPC is highly creative. The two are chalk and cheese. In my view, in key respects, though not all, Russian foreign policy bears a much closer relationship to that of the United States than to China. Both the US and the USSR stroke Russia have frequently invaded other countries. China has not invaded any apart from Vietnam in 1979 and it immediately withdrew. In this context, like Jenny, I regard Taiwan as part of China to be a completely different matter. This brings me to my third point. It is true that China in its reporting of the Ukraine war has been largely sympathetic to Russia's case, but that more or less is about it. Contrary to much Western speculation, it is clear that China, and Xi Jinping in particular, was not party to Putin's intention to invade Ukraine, though it was warned by the Americans that an invasion was there in their view imminent. It has not supplied any military equipment to Russia. It abstained in the United Nations General Assembly vote on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It has scrupulously avoided breaching the sanctions regime imposed on Russia by the Western powers. It has sent humanitarian aid to Ukraine and it has been far from alone in this approach. The virtually universal opprobrium towards Russia that has characterized the Western response to the war is not shared by a very large part of the world, probably the majority, most notably of all India. There is no question that on balance, the war has made China's position more difficult. Russia's action breached one of the fundamental tenets of Chinese foreign policy, namely the respect for sovereignty and the principle of non-intervention. China, of course, has not always opposed foreign interventions, but it certainly has in a majority of cases. Its relatively neutral stance on the war has left it vulnerable to Western criticism. It has watched anxiously as the West, led by the US, has weaponized sanctions on an entirely new scale, including the freezing of the Russian central bank's dollar ask assets. In this context, it served as a stark warning to China of what might happen if it decided to invade Taiwan. And while a large part of the world was not of a not dissimilar view to China on the war, on the war in the various UN votes, China was generally in a small minority, an uncomfortable position to be in. Finally, of course, the war, at least so far, has served to unify the United States and Europe to an extent not previously seen since the end of the Cold War, including, of course, the extension of NATO and now the increase in defense spending in Europe. Could China have played a different role? Could it have been a mediator? In the early stages, I thought it could and should. But in retrospect, I am unconvinced that this would have worked. Putin would never have listened to China. He had determined on his course. Turkey attempted mediation, as did Israel, and they got nowhere. The two sides were too far apart, though at some point that will change. But that is for another time, or perhaps the later discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Martin, for that very uh, succinct and uh, thought-provoking uh, contribution with um, a number of um, very important points uh, made and, and important clarifications. Uh, I've been following your uh, comments on on the on the war on Twitter, and it's uh, 
good to see everything concentrated in, in one place. So thank you very much for, for your support and contribution. It's much appreciated. Um, our next uh, speaker is John Gittings. John is a journalist and author who is mainly known for his work on modern China. John first traveled to China with Saku in 1971 and has kept in regular contact with our organization over many years. After teaching at the University of Westminster, he worked at The Guardian, the British daily newspaper, of course, for 20 years as the chief foreign leader writer and the East Asia editor between 1983 to 2003. He is currently a research associate at the China Institute of the School of Oriental and African Studies at London University and an associate editor of the Oxford International Encyclopedia of Peace. His book, The Glorious Art of Peace, From the Iliad to Iraq, was published in 2012. Uh, those are that's those comments are, are based on on the materials that uh, that John sent us. I should say that I think he's been extremely modest. John's role in understanding China and promoting understanding of China in, in Britain and indeed throughout the world has been really immense since, since the 1960s um, in in academic work and uh, among progressive people and in the Journal of Contemporary China and so on. He's written numerous books on China, of course, and he's also was really a pioneer in Westminster University back in the right back to the days when it was the Polytechnic of Central London of getting, of building up and establishing the teaching of the Chinese language in this country at a time when incredibly um, it was scarcely taught uh, anywhere. So it's really kind of John to, to join us and uh, I invite him to share his thoughts with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keith. Um, I think there's a lot I still don't understand after all these years or decades and a lot that we don't understand, but we had to do our best. Um, I'd like to start by congratulating Saku on organizing this um, session. I think it's really great that we are here together um, particularly good to have uh, Minister Wang to give us the uh, official Chinese view and I'm looking forward very much to Victor Gao giving us an independent viewpoint from Beijing. Um, Keith, you mentioned at the start that we, in fact, we did more than mention, you alerted us to the fact that we face the danger of nuclear conflict and that the Ukraine war is a turning point. And it's in that context I want to um, frame my remarks. It's uh, three months since Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, an act of aggression under the United Nations Charter. That's not my opinion, that is the opinion of 141 members of the United Nations in their resolution of the 2nd of March. That is 73% of the UN membership and far more than what you might call the usual Western, pro-Western suspects. Um, and we've now had, indeed, we have indeed reached a turning point. Um, I mean, it is appalling to think that we are now talking, we are now accepting the prospect that this is going to be a long war. Um, and we've been told by the British Prime Minister, it might go on to the end of next year and others have said even longer. And at the same time, it's appalling that we are talking calmly, quite calmly, about the possibility of a nuclear conflict. You, know, you turn on Radio 4 and you find a discussion about that. Um, we can't just sail blindly on like this. We have to take action. Um, I believe that we have a, we all of us, each of us, have a personal responsibility to take what action we can. Uh, in our case, so those of us who are in, this, in, the, in, in Britain should be urging our government uh, not to accept this long-term uh, view of the of inevitable war, but to be much more active in trying to, trying to stop it. Um, and at the, na at, the, at the level of nation states, we need to see far more active diplomacy. Now, China, uh, I, I may say, what I'm going to say about China is quite critical, but a lot of my criticisms 
can be applied, and I do apply to Britain as well, and to other state actors, but today we're talking about China. Um, China, and for that, match, for that matter, Britain, have a particular responsibility under the UN Charter, uh, I'm going to quote Article 24, as Security Council members, primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. So it is really up to, up to us, I'm saying us, China and Britain and others, I would like to see these two, our two countries working together to be far more active in the diplomatic field. Um, China, of course, as others have said, uh, is one of the world's strongest nations and therefore uh, has even more, you may say, has even more heft, carries even more weight than we do. Uh, Keith said that we are at a turning point in the war, and I agree. Uh, we've reached a situation where um, the Ukrainian forces, having made some considerable gains, are on the defensive again. And we really face two choices. One is that the West is going to supply Ukraine with even more lethal weapons in order to prolong the war. Uh, and, uh, and with all its dangers, its nuclear dangers and other dangers, uh, you know, we haven't even considered uh, the knock-on effect on the other existential crises affecting the world, how we no longer talk about the pandemic uh, and how we talk much less about climate change. Um, that is one alternative. That is a dire alternative of the long war. The alternative is to bring about an end to the war, to stop the war. It may sound naive, stop the war is a slogan, but it is a slogan we have to, we have to explore and, and we have to insist upon. I'm pleased to note that uh, a few days ago, uh, uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky uh, said that this war can only be, only be ended by diplomacy. And he has previously indicated perhaps a softer line than other uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, pe people in the Ukrainian leadership that he is prepared to discuss certain uh, territorial co compromises in a peace settlement. Now, China um, often says, uh, in relation to other countries, that they will be impressed by deeds and not words. And while I respect a lot of the things China has said and is saying, uh, they are words. And I suggest that we should expect more deeds from China. And I'm going to look at three areas where I could suggest very specific things which China and others could and should be doing. And I'm going to focus particularly on the United Nations. There are three areas there where I would like to see Chinese action with Britain and with others. And first, most obvious perhaps, is to rally around the rank and file of the UN membership, those 141 members and more, to call for an immediate ceasefire in Ukraine. I'm pleased to note that China has once or twice, I think particularly in the meeting of the Indian and the Chinese foreign ministers, called for an immediate ceasefire, though I haven't heard it do so more recently, but that call should be raised. Second, I would like to see much more support for the Secretary General. Now, when, uh, when he went to Moscow and Kiev in, in the last month, he had nil support from any of the permanent members of the Security Council. No statement from Britain in support of his mission, no statement from China, no statement from France or the United States, obviously none from, from, uh, from Russia. So when people complain about the, US, the United Nations being useless, and when his mission was judged a failure, we have to say that the United Nations is only useless when we don't use it, and we need to use it. And I would like to see, and I suggest that the Security Council should have full support to play the role which, which is delegated to him in the Charter of of mediating in, in this dispute. 
negotiation, inquiry, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, judicial settlement, and other peaceful means is what the Charter calls out for. The third area in the United Nations, which may be rather more long range, but I think we need to, to start talking about it now, is to prepare for UN peacekeepers to be able to, to go onto the ground in Ukraine. The UN has had uh, 72 peacekeeping missions in the world since the first one in 1948, of which 14 are current today. Uh, it has great experience of this, but it needs to, uh, it, needs to take, it takes time to get the commitments uh, and allocate the forces and, and, and so on. That is a discussion which also should begin now. Now, again, you may say, oh, this is the, it is unrealistic, it's difficult, but I would say that diplomacy is about doing what is difficult, it's not about doing what is easy. Now that is the United Nations. Uh, secondly, I, uh, just a few words on Chinese diplomacy, bilateral and multilateral. Um, I, mean, I won't get the whole question of what, Russia, what China is saying to Russia, what President Xi has said, said to Putin, it, it's difficult to explore because basically we have no idea. Um, uh, we, are, we, we are always told that China does this in its own way. And I haven't come across anywhere in any Chinese state or Chinese media, any expl explanation what China's own way might be. Uh, while I, I quite agree that China is not a wholehearted supporter of Russia, and it has made that clear in a number of ways, and it's excellent that China supports the territorial integrity of Ukraine, it has created the unfortunate impression that it might be uh, overly sympathetic to the Russian interpretation of events. Uh, just to give you one example, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the massacres and the killings in Bucha, China quite reasonably said, we need to have a full impartial investigation of what happened. But the Chinese media have only published the tendentious and often ridiculous Russian claims that every civilian, every Ukrainian civilian uh, who was killed there was either an actor pretending to be dead or had been shot by the Ukrainian forces. A little bit more balance in the Chinese media wouldn't be a bad idea. And if I could very delicately suggest it, maybe, just maybe, the Chinese media could even start calling the war a war. I'm reminded of that um, Chinese uh, uh, story from the, uh, uh, about uh, um, the uh, uh, conniving minister who insisted that people should call a deer a horse, Zhu um, Lu Weima. Uh, well, a deer is a deer, and a horse is a horse, and a war is a war. So that's bilateral diplomacy with Russia, and uh, one would like to see much more discussion between China and Britain and other countries on one issue in particular. I think there has been some discussion, but not very much. Uh, preparing the ground for giving security guarantees to Ukraine um, if and when uh, peace can be achieved. Uh, finally, just a few words on humanitarian aid. Uh, again, China, what China has said is excellent. It's uh, the, is it the five points or the six points of Minister Foreign, Foreign Minister Wang Yi on, humani on the humanitarian crisis and the need to provide aid which was um, issued very early on. Um, I've been trying to track the number of consignments of Chinese humanitarian aid to Ukraine. And maybe I haven't looked hard enough, but I've only found two in March, one to the value of a million dollars, one to the value of a million and a half, and maybe a third referred to by CCTV, but I can't find any statement about it from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, be, if there's a lot more, I, it'd, be, it'd be great, I think, from China's point of view, to tell us what it is. Now, I'm sure that, um, I'm sure that uh, Ukraine is very grateful for what it, whatever it gets, but quite honestly, that's rather 
uh, small beer and China could give a lot more. It also give an indication of much more aid to come for the economic uh, reconstruction of the shattered Ukrainian infrastructure at the end of the war. Finally, just one, one more word, just uh, looking back in history, it's 85 years since Japan invaded China, saying that it was doing so in order to uh, eliminate communism. Uh, it's 85 years since Japan invaded China and uh, engaged in uh, indiscriminate bombing and shelling and the massacre of civilians. Uh, I just think that perhaps it might be worth reflecting on the possible analogy with today, with today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John. I'm, I'm sure everybody uh, will identify with your very impassioned uh, appeal for peace. And I'm also sure that uh, your concrete suggestions uh, will, 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 have been, uh, will have been noted. And thank you also for actually flagging up the fact that uh, humanity th faces what I consider to be three existen existential threats to its existence at the moment, that is zoonotic and other pandemics, uh, cl the threat of climate catastrophe and the threat of nuclear war, and uh, that we should not lose sight of, of, of these issues um, in, the, in the midst of, of the, uh, the, the Ukraine situation. So thank you very much indeed, uh, John. And we come to our final speaker of, of this evening. Our final speaker is Victor Gao. He is the vice president of the China, the Center for China and Globalization, the chair professor of Suzhou University and the chairman of the China Energy Security Institute. He has, a, he has extensive experience in government diplomacy, securities regulation, legal affairs, investment banking, private equity, corporate management, and the media. I certainly see him on webinars and, and on the Chinese media uh, regularly, and it's always extremely interesting what he has to say. Victor was an English language interpreter for Deng Xiaoping in the 1980s. He must have learned an awful lot from that. And he holds a JD from Yale Law School and a, an MA in International Relations from the Political Science Department of the Yale Graduate School, an MA in English from Beijing University of Foreign Studies, and a BA in English from Suzhou University. And he is also a licensed attorney at law in the, in the state of New York. Uh, if you look him up online, you'll see that's only a very inadequate summary of his many activities and uh, distinguished um, features. I, I recognize his... Um, his uh, home, I presume, having seen it many times on the CGTN and elsewhere. I'm particularly grateful to Victor because it's now the middle of the night um, in China, but he's looking as alert as ever. And uh, so it's my great honor to, um, to ask you to speak, Victor. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you very much. It's a great honor for me to attend this very important webinar. And uh, I know uh, time is uh, uh, very restricted. So if I uh, speak a little bit longer, please interrupt me at the appropriate time. Uh, allow me to make several points. One is that while the attention of the world is now engrossed on the situation in Ukraine, call it a war or military operations, it doesn't matter. I think it is time for mankind as a whole to look beyond into the future. I hope we can look to the year 2122, that is 100 years from now. So what will be the situation in 2122, 100 years from today? I can see two extreme possibilities, starting with the worst case scenario. I think the worst case scenario for the world in 2122 is that there will be no world. The earth will continue to uh, revolve around the sun, but mankind will have disappeared. Uh, what's the reason? Uh, who cares about the disappearance of mankind from the earth? And uh, whether there are victims or victors, uh, injustices or justices, etc. nobody will care because by then, 100 years from today, 
the world will be gone. Homo sapien will be gone from the earth. And uh, no one will know what exactly caused it. They will know maybe 5 million years later that something happened in 2022 or soon thereafter, but nobody really would have enough evidence to trace back the real origin or the sequence of the events leading to the disappearance of mankind from the earth. And where is Ukraine? Where is Russia? Where is the United States? Where is Britain? Where is China? No one will care because it's all become moot because of a nuclear disaster. I think mankind has never been as close to the brink of a nuclear holocaust as we are now, even though most of the countries and mankind to a very large extent care not to think about it. And countries like Great Britain either do not know the consequence of a nuclear holocaust or they choose to ignore that or pretend not to think about it at all. And they are still doing things which you know, 100 years from now may actually be interpreted as leading the world closer and closer to the brink of a nuclear holocaust and eventually pushing mankind into that nuclear holocaust. So this is the worst case scenario I can think about it. And it keeps me up at night, including tonight, for example. I cannot go to sleep with the sanity of my mind. Now, what is the best case scenario involving Ukraine 100 years from now? I think the best case scenario for Ukraine is that it will be one of the, if not the wealthiest, richest, happiest countries in Europe, if not in the world at large. Why? Because if you look at the situation involving Ukraine, it really has all the ingredients to make the great success that the Ukrainian people deserve. If I use the wisdom of Deng Xiaoping a little bit to apply that to Ukraine, Ukraine can make huge successes, a great transformation of the country, but they need to satisfy one or two preconditions. One is to maintain stability, and secondly, is to be friends with all and be enemy with none. This is a great challenge. Over the past 30 years or so, Ukraine has squandered lots of opportunities and they embarked on one initiative after another, many of which are contradictory to each other. And by uh, before February the 24th, Ukraine literally had become an open battleground. Uh, between Russia on the one hand and the United States and NATO on the other hand. So this is no farm. This will destroy any chance of development and prosperity for the Ukrainian people. And this is exactly the main reason why there is so much tragedy and agony in Ukraine. So I think if Ukraine can really straighten out the situation, becoming a country of permanent neutrality, for example, and becoming a great compromiser, and a place where East, West, North, South can all converge and then believe in the Ukrainians being the best. And Ukraine should be its own value rather than attaching Ukraine to any other system or any other bloc, for example. So I think Ukraine can do that. If China can do this tremendous amount of transformation in the matter of 43, 44 years, Ukraine can make huge achievements in a matter of a century, given its ge uh, geographical position, its riches of resources, and the high level of intelligence of the people, and really the commitment of the people to peace and stability. Now, where are we now? I think, very unfortunately, Ukraine is becoming the major battleground between Russia on the one hand, and not just the Ukrainian people on the other hand, by the United States and NATO and the West in general. Now, uh, when we talk about NATO, it has become a very controversial issue now. So allow me to talk about NATO in the context of Mongolia. You know, Mongolia is a country uh, landlocked between Russia to its north and China to its south. And uh, uh, Mongolia has been peaceful since 1991, 1992. 
and uh, it has only two neighbors, Russia and China. But you may know or you may not know that Mongolia has a partnership agreement with NATO. Every year, there are NATO exercises in Mongolia, most of which along Mongolian Chinese border, sometimes along Russian Mongolian border. And Mongolia is a cyber cooperation partner of NATO. Now, allow me to ask one question. Do you think, first of all, NATO has a legitimacy in operating inside Mongolia? Secondly, do you think such intrusive operations inside Mongolia by NATO will promote peace and stability in this part of the world or destroy peace and stability uh, in our part of the world? The China-Mongolian border is only about 400 kilometers away from my home only about 400 kilometers away. And if you think about NATO troops, not in any European country, not in Ukraine, but in Mongolia, for example, how would a decision maker in China think about NATO? How would a decision maker or military leader in Russia think about NATO? I think if anyone believes that NATO is an angel, it has a flawless record, and it is truly an alliance for defensive purposes, then you need to ask, what does Mongolia have to do with North Atlantic Treaty geographically? And what can NATO do to help bring in greater stability in this region involving Russia, China, and Mongolia? So if we use the same a benchmark to look at Mongolia on the one hand and then look at Ukraine on the other hand, then I think the Chinese government's position is absolutely justifiable because uh, Ukraine, especially after 2014, has really been a major training ground preparation center for bringing NATO into uh, Ukraine. And there is only one purpose, it is against Russia. So if anyone believes that President Putin or Russia government will really be cursed if they uh, take the initiative to launch the military operations into Ukraine on February the 24th without any justification, come on. I think we need to be realistic. I hope Ukraine will really make up its mind and choose to become a neutral country and this still remains my view uh, after Finland and Sweden want to join NATO uh, anyway. So this is one point I want to make. Another point allow me to make is that I truly believe there will be no lasting peace in Europe by excluding Russia. I also truly believe there will be no lasting peace in the world by excluding Russia. After all, Russia, historically speaking, is very, very unique. It is not a first tier country by economic size, for example. It is only about one tenth the size of China. China's Guangdong province, China's Jiangsu province where I was born were both larger than Russia economically speaking. However, Russia does have very unique characteristics. It has the largest nuclear arsenal. So anyone which urges a longer war with Russia involving Ukraine or beyond Ukraine runs the risk of cornering Russia and President Putin into the corner, and then they will be left with no other choice but push, press for the button. And if the war in Ukraine is escalating from conventional war into nuclear war, and if the war in Ukraine is spilling over into countries like Poland and many others, many of which happen to be NATO members, for example, if, for example, Britain is serious, in sending its own joint flotilla into the Black Sea, try to escort the shipment of grain from Ukraine to the Black Sea and uh, into the Mediterranean, for example, it may trigger not a de-escalation, but escalation of the tension and the war in Ukraine, eventually pushing it beyond the point of no return. And then before we realize we are hit with this worst case scenario, and by 21, 22, there will be no more human uh, homo sapo, uh, sapien uh, 
uh, species left in the world. Now, allow me to uh, add another point. That is why this is the time for all of us, including all the NATO members, to practice diplomacy. I think if we listen very carefully to what President Zelensky has to say on many occasions, we are already in the, we will be already in the middle of the Third World War. You know, such ideas about driving Russia away from one of the five permanent member states of the Security Council, for example, tearing down the United Nations and uh, 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 punishing Russia so that it will be on its knee for 1,000 years to come, overthrowing the Russian government and put uh, President Putin onto trial, for example. All these are very fanciful ideas. They may be very active in President Zelensky's mind, but whether this can be practiced and what will be the consequence if they are really put to practice, I think we are talking about increasing danger if we do not really exercise diplomacy in the maximum form to bring the United States, Russia, NATO, and Ukraine together onto the same table to figure out what's the best way to call it off. No more war in Ukraine and restore peace and make sure that the Ukrainian people are not sacrificed for whatever geopolitical purposes. Russia did the wrong thing to invade Ukraine, that's for sure but to urge for the prolongation of the war in itself and possibly escalation of the war may be greater mistake than purely just starting the war in itself. So I think uh, 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 we are at truly at a uh, inflection point. We cannot wait more time. We cannot wait for too long because time may be running out very soon. And uh, uh, I personally believe the world of today have all the ingredients for a major conflagration into the Third World War. And no one will be saved if the Third World War hits us because it will definitely not be restricted to a conventional war. It will most likely be involving nuclear holocaust. So I think uh, uh, we need to uh, really exercise maximum uh, uh, eagerness to uh, put a lid onto this war. I think while the war in Ukraine today is very horrendous, any escalation and spilling over into other NATO member states will be much worse. While we all need to save the Ukrainian people, saving mankind is at least equally important, if not more important than purely saving the Ukrainian people. As a matter of fact, these two things cannot be pick and choose. We need to save both. Saving Ukrainian people is the same as saving mankind, but it's not based on, let's say, democracy versus autocracy. I'm amazed and amused by the fact that President Biden, while visiting Seoul and uh, Tokyo, you know, he, uh, before he left the United States, he visited that uh, a black community where uh, about 2,000 people were killed by a white supremacist uh, in the United States. And then before he landed in Washington DC again, there was another uh, gun violence killing about 22 persons in Texas. So I think we also need to urge the United States to really put its own house in order. And the values that's represented by the United States are not universal values. For example, gun violence. Can anyone like Britain or France or Germany, any Western country can say, we share the same values as the United States. We want to have the constitutionally protected uh, a right of the people to bear arms. No, this is not universal values and the deeply rooted racism and uh, discrimination against minorities, etc. These are not universal values. So to put a simple separation of countries into so-called democracy on the one hand and autocracies on the other hand, I think this is artificial to start with. It will not promote world peace and stability, and it may eventually cause greater instability in the world of today. I hope 
NATO will truly be defensive, and I hope NATO will no longer further expand, at least not to Mongolia, because I've been to Mongolia many, many times, and I'm, I will be scared if Mongolia has a closer and closer military cooperation with NATO, and I will be very unhappy if I see NATO presence just on my doorstep. And I will be very eager to urge my government to take some remedial measures in the coming weeks or months against this imminent NATO intrusion just into China's doorstep. And I think we also need to have this kind of thinking if we put ourselves into the minds of the Russian military to see the ever encroaching uh, presence of NATO into uh, Ukraine. And I think Ukraine should no longer be a battleground between NATO, United States, Britain, and NATO member states on the one hand, and Russia on the other hand. Ukraine can be a unifying point, a major connectivity point, bringing all countries together, including Russia and including the United States and all the NATO member states, EU member states, etc. I think this is the crux of the matter facing mankind today. We need to save Ukraine, we need to save mankind, and we need to save Homo sapiens. Thank you very much. Victor, thank you so much for that brilliant uh, presentation. Um, there's a, an English saying, I'm sure you're familiar with it, that you saved the best wine till last. And uh, so um, it's in that spirit that, uh, that we listen to you. And uh, thank you for, for your analysis and for putting very clearly and sharply uh, the stark choices uh, that the present situation uh, presents to, to all of humanity. And again, I'm especially grateful uh, to you for staying up so late to, to present to us and, and to join us. We're really honored. And uh, I don't think I'm as fluent as that um, at any time of the day, let alone at 2.30 in the morning. So thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, that really brings us to uh, the end of, um, of our proceedings uh, th this evening. Um, I apologize that um, we've not had time to have a, a question and answer period um, this time, uh, but I didn't want to interrupt um, any of the speakers uh, because they all had uh, such important things to say, such interesting things to say. They'd all taken care with their presentations and, and I don't think it would have been respectful to the speakers. And I don't think it would have added to the um, uh, benefit to the audience by by cutting people short. The fact that uh, uh, we still have around 100 people on the call shows, I think, that every single speaker has um, held people's attention. And although there's not uh, time for question and answer tonight, as, as I mentioned at the start of, of the meeting, this is a kind of part one of two for SACU's initiative on, on this. Um, we have a further uh, meeting on June the 9th at 5 p.m., which is a special uh, China chat, as, as, as we call it. And that will be with an open mic for SACU members to freely discuss all the points uh, that have been raised on this issue by the various speakers this evening. And uh, of course, um, to raise any other points uh, uh, that they might want to make. And as I mentioned that uh, in order to facilitate a, a free discussion, that meeting will be for SACU members only. So if you want to continue the discussion and you're not already a SACU member, do please join, it's, it's the perfect time. Um, I'm sure there's, uh, I'm sure if you go to our website, um, you can find uh, details of how to join and perhaps, uh, perhaps the organizers of the meeting might send an email to everyone who's registered to invite them to join if they haven't already done so. Of course, if any of our speakers who are not members, um, of, uh, of, of SACU uh, would like to, to join us, um, uh, they would of course be, be very welcome, just get in touch with us. And uh, my colleague Jacob is um, showing on the screen um, at the moment how, how, how to join. So it's, um, anyway, it's SACU.org, um, we'll, we'll, we'll bring you there, but it's being displayed on the screen right now. 
Uh, we're just a little bit over time. So I want to thank everybody again for having uh, been at this meeting and uh, look forward to um, work, continuing the discussion, working with you all in the future. Thanks again for your support. We do appreciate it and wish you all success, uh, every one of you in, in your work and activities. Uh, thank you very much and good evening and to China, good morning. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye bye. bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. So